but you can't, you can't replicate learning to fly a plane. You have to go fly the plane, right? And um, that's why you, you need the academic side of things, but I think more importantly is the practice side of things. Because uh, it's one thing. I took, all right, I took shop class when I was in school. And uh, the way the shop class was designed was, uh, and you could tell that this guy and the people that took shop, uh, maybe I need to clarify, shop, what I was calling shop was like engines, okay? So we, we worked with engines, we tore apart lawnmower engines, things like that. And so their goal was to get through the book stuff as quickly as you could so that you could go tear apart that engine. And uh, so we spent about two or three weeks of the semester going through all the book. Well, I was wonderful at the book stuff. That's my area of comfort, you know. <laughs> uh, test me on where those, you know, how many pistons does it have? What is it supposed to do? You can press it, you know. And I got into tearing those engine apart, and I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew all the stuff. I knew all the book. And I had a kid that was kind of the opposite way of me, you know. He... He could care less or couldn't care less, however you say that thing, you know, <laughs> about going through the books. But uh, he loved, and you could tell he had practice with the engines. And when it come, when the rubber met the road and you got a screwdriver in your hand, if you know what you're doing, that's, that's really where the value is, amen? That's the value. And so I got kind of set back because once we got done with the book learning, I got in there and I started stripping screws bare because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and you just mess up an engine real quick if you don't. And this other kid, he's, he was my partner. He says, no, don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. We'll never get that screw out. <laughs> you know. <laughs> See, and, and, and the same thing is true with God. All right. You, you can read and thank God for the truth of the word, but it's meant to be practiced. It's meant to, it's meant to be explored. It's, it's meant to, you're, you're supposed to sail the ship out into the sea, not just admire it in the dock. You know, you're supposed to take, take on the love of God more f on, a, on a routine basis. Experiencing God's love is not the same thing as reading God loves me. All right? And, 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 and it's part of experiencing and having God's love wash over you through times of presence and times of worship that really is what changes you changes how you behave, changes how you see things, see. And how are you going to love people when all it is is book knowledge, you know? You have to feel it. You have to experience it. It has to become part of you, you know? And in so many of, um, you, you know, really effective pilots, the plane is an extension of them. The plane is something that they, they feel it, you know, they feel the air, they feel the shake, they feel, you know, just like driving a car, they feel it. And, and, and it's supposed to be the same way. You and God are supposed to walk through life together and feel situations with him. You're supposed to put that into practice. Everybody say practice. See, theoretical, and I'll, I'll just be honest most of the church is wrapped up in academic theoretical knowledge, not practice. And I'll just sit myself down there, okay? Because I love to talk and share about hearing God's voice. I love to talk and share about what I see in the Word, and then I love exploring that stuff. What happens when you're in Walmart and God shares with you something? See, you, you got to take the boat out of the dock and you have to go. You have to go, um, what was the, what's that phrase? I don't know where it came from, but smooth seas never made for a good sailor. Anybody ever heard that? Smooth seas never made for a good sailor. What's the point of faith if you can't move a pebble? <laughs> the whole point of knowing God and getting to know God is so that you can move bigger and bigger mountains out of people's lives. The whole point of growing faith. It's not just faith for faith's sake. It's so that you begin to move blockages and remove strongholds and to take things on and to remove strongholds from, you start with you, but it's not supposed to end with you. It's not supposed to just be, I got free and whoopee and I'll go share. You know, it's supposed to be that when you encounter other people's situations, you move those things out of their life too. You get them set free. That's the ultimate goal. Everybody with me? Amen. 
And see, part of knowing God, it can't happen here. It can happen here in degrees. But we're after a transformed life. Everybody say transformed. See, transformation takes, it takes, hmm, um, okay. Anybody had a chance to watch any of the Olympics yet? Just a little bit here and there? No, maybe not. All right. Now, transformation, what does it take to transform into, say, an athlete, an Olympic athlete? All right. Anybody here ready to compete in the Olympics? I know I'm not. (laughs) See, well, what kind of process? Let's say, do you think, let's say this, this, is, this is what the, the athlete does. I bet if I attend the gym every Sunday at 1030 to noon, I bet if I keep going like that every week, within a couple years, I'll be, I'll be the best in the world. You think that's what they do? <laughs> You know, I come, I come to the gym, I get in that atmosphere, I feel that, you know, smell. <laughs> you can feel a smell in the gym, right? Anybody ever feel a smell? <laughs> Maybe that's the boys' locker room. All right. And, and now, you're gonna, are you going to be benefited? Well, yeah, you're going to be benefited. Are you going to be changed? Yeah. But are you going to be transformed? It's going to take a long time. And the way, uh, the way a pastor I greatly respect put it, he says, you know, you can take, you, you can get a bachelor's degree and the, the, um, the whole plan of a bachelor's degree is to get it in four years, right? Four years, pretty consistent. You take anywhere from 13 to 16, maybe 18 hours a semester. If you keep that pace up in four years, you're going to get it done, right? Well, you can accomplish that in four years. You can accomplish that if you're really crazy. You can maybe three Okay, what if you took half of that? You can accomplish it in eight years, a quarter of that. You can, you can stretch that bachelor's degree all the way out into 16 years. Same. Transformation takes a pace, and it takes a amount of time. And so I'm going to springboard off of what we talked about last week, and if you weren't here last week, you can listen to it online. It, I really enjoyed preaching that message because it's something that he's been showing me is that transformation isn't just about book knowledge, although that's important, and getting the word in your spirit is something we've taught on a lot, okay? But there's a transformation that takes place through accomplishing times with him on a more routine basis. And somebody that's going to, and Paul said it, Paul used the Olympians in his day. He used the Olympians. He said they, they do it for a corruptible crown. Am I right? So... When they stand up on stage and they're giving out those gold medals, those gold medals are a symbol of what they've achieved, but they're not going to get to take those with them, right? They're a corruptible crown. They're something that won't last. But we do it, he says, for an incorruptible. He says, and I don't do it uncertainly. I'm not beating the air. I fight certainly, he says. And he says it this way. He says, do you remember? He says, I keep my body under subjection. Everybody remember this. If by any means I myself might be a castaway. This is the Apostle Paul. And that castaway, that's the same word as reprobate. You know, when it talks about in, Ro- in Romans, the, the reprobate, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are unseemly. In other words, what Paul was saying is, look, everybody that's born has the same flesh. Everybody's got a flesh. And every step out of the flesh is a step into the spirit. What mom shared this morning was just perfect for what we're sharing right now. Every step you take out of your flesh is a step into more of the spirit of God. And every step out of the spirit of God is a step into your flesh. Guess what? If you don't pray, you probably won't feel like praying. (laughs) If you don't actually spend time in the word and you do that to yourself repeatedly over and over and over and over and over and over again, I I don't think you're just going to wake up one day and feel like spending time in the Word. You have to make that choice. And just like an athlete has to choose, I got to get up and go to the gym again. And they were highlighting some of these guys that, that they're, they're on this world stage now. They are in there six hours a day training for stuff like this. And they say, oh yeah, we throw up all the time. <laughs> we just run until we puke our guts. And then the next day we do it again. 
people who do, you know, they'll ski for 10 miles and then the next day they got to go do it again, 20 miles. They, I mean, just insane. And they, now we, we look at that and we appreciate the accomplishment. But see, we want, and this is, if we're going to be disciples of Christ, doesn't he say to pick up your cross daily? I mean, not just that one time. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. So there is a, a routine and this is what, how transformation is accomplished. Transformation is accomplished through times. And, and there was a presence here this morning that accomplished change in your mind. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I feel that presence. And I, I feel peace. And it changes the way that you see things. The way when situations come up in real life that come against you, you can see what's on the inside of people when situations hit them. Am I right? When a situation hits you, what's on the inside, the programming that's in there, what comes out? Is it, is it the fruit of the spirit or is it the fruit of the flesh? You know, And, and this is what we do in church. We are, we're able to put on a show you know, for that hour and a half. But then when you go home, that's who you really are. And see, whether you like it or not, God fellowships with who you really are, not the show you put on for everybody else. That's who he has to work with, see. But you are his child, and we are transforming into the image of Christ. That's what our goal is. And so he was showing me in some of my private prayer time, he's like, the, look, the degree that you spend time with me, it transforms how you see things. And so I would spend time in prayer, and this is what he shared with me. He'll talk to you, and, and the more you listen, the more he'll talk. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It just keeps rolling and getting better and better and better. And you keep taking more and more ground. And one of the things he told me, he says, you know how fast when you fast, fasting the body, what fasting the body does is that if you've ever gone on a fast and you feel terrible, <laughs> right, that first day, that first four hours, <laughs> you feel terrible because partly your body is starting to clean and detoxify and get rid of some of that junk and and, and so there is this kind of uh, cleaning out effect that your body goes through. Now, after you're done, you feel incredible. And even, even if, and they've, I, I can't give you the study, but I have read, and I'm, I feel confident to share it because I've experienced it, okay? If you fast and you do a three-day fast, your immune system completely rebuilds itself. And I'll testify that when I've come off a fast, I very rarely get sick. Okay, and it takes me a long time to wear my body down to the place, you know, through, through overeating and indulgence and stuff like that, where my immune system finally says, okay, we cannot handle all of this. We're, we're, we're tired. We're, we're lethargic. I'm going to get sick, <laughs> you know. Well, th when you fast, the body has time to refresh and recuperate and rejuvenate itself. And it gets, and there's tremendous energy and, and, and your mind is clear and all that. And the Lord told me, he says, in the same way, when you fast the body, that happens. Prayer is like fasting for your mind. And we create an atmosphere for our thoughts. And we create an atmosphere for our, how we approach situations. And see, you know, we have a culture right now where the young people are especially, are, unless they constantly have, and, and I don't think it's just young people, but there's an addiction to screens, and I love screens, okay? I got like 20 of them, okay? But, but if you can't put it down, you got a problem. If you put it down for five minutes and you have to run over there and pick it back up again, you've got a problem. Let's see. And there is this atmosphere that we create for our mind. We must be entertained. And maybe screens isn't your thing. Maybe it's books. Now, you can say books are better, but books are books, and what's ever in them that you're running across your mind is creating an atmosphere for what you're thinking. If it's a good book or a bad book, you can be addicted to books, and you need to shut them down for a while. TV, okay? So whatever it is, your thought life, it's like a pond. <laughs> and if you keep throwing stuff in it, eventually it's going to get full of whatever you're throwing in it, the dirt, the distractions, the benign things and the non-benign things, whatever that may be. And in all of that clutter and in all of that thought life, you know, TV, what does so-and-so say? What is this opinion? 
I can remember my dad get so, so upset watching the news, especially about political stuff, you know. <laughs> Take your shoe off and just... <laughs> 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 I don't know. Well, you, you run that through your soul 24-7, you're going to be upset all the time. Anybody ever met somebody just ready to fight because they're always fighting about that thing? You know? Oh, I wasn't going to hit this. I, I, all right, I try to avoid this. The devil loves taking things of the word, getting people off on them, and they can think they're doing God's work and they're just wasting their time. He loves doing that. One of the ways he does that is with end time prophecy. I have run into people, they are spinning their wheels for years talking about, trying to figure out who's the Antichrist going to be. How are we going to get the mark? How are we going to... uh, you know, let's store up stuff in our basement in case it's time yet. How about you trust God? <laughs> I, you know, bunk, you're bunkering down, the world's needing saving. He didn't say to stay in your basement. <laughs> he said to win the world. Am I right? And they can be, you can get so full of that. Why are they full of it? Because it's all they feed on. They read They'll read a book about, and, and it interprets what's going on right now through the scriptures, which won't apply in five years. And so they know for sure that Jesus is coming in the back. They know for sure that this man is this person in history, that the stars, the way they are right now, it's perfect for, for you know, um, the, what is it? They, there was some conference that was about the peace, uh, about peace in the world. Uh, it was in September, and, and one of the places, Paul just says, that they shall say peace and safety, and then so sudden destruction, destruction comes. Well, some random peace conference, they said that applies to this. We're going to have the rapture. September has come and gone. October has come and gone. Uh, whatever, 20 other things that has come and gone. Why are they full of that? Because they fill themselves with it. They read the latest jargon that doesn't apply now. And I'm sorry if some of these things take you for loops. Pray in the Holy Ghost and they won't take you for loops. <clears throat> People hand me stuff. No. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, blood moons. They're a loop and it's over. You, the next phase, what is that Mayan thing? It's a loop and it's over. You've spun your wheels, but the thing is, the same people fall for it again and again and again because they are filling their hearts and their minds with that kind of thinking. Um, And it's self-feeding. It continues in a certain direction and it continues and it continues and it dead ends and this is what the... This is what the devil does. He comes to steal the word. And see, we keep looking for the devil to come steal the word like he's gonna come take the Bible out of our hands. No, it's stuff like that. He comes and steals the word. He robs the effectiveness of what's trying to be sown in your life by planting other things. See, And he plants fear and plants delusion and plants uh, you know, uh, divisiveness. And he's, he does the same thing with the country that we live in. Planting these things produces a crop and, 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 uh, and, and he keeps people in bondage that way. See, he that prays in an unknown tongue prays not unto men but unto God, howbeit in the spirit he's speaking mysteries. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. See, when you spend time praying in the spirit, you are inoculating yourself against those bugs that he's spending out. You're inoculating yourself against those deceptions because if you spend time with the Holy Ghost, if you spend time in his classroom and he's praying things through you, if you spend time like what Jude said, Jude said pray in the spirit and be built up, right? So when you spend time, but ye beloved, building up yourselves upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, doing that keeps you from deception. Doing that keeps you in the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit's job to lead you and guide you into all truth. And I, the more I spend time praying in the Spirit, the more sensitive I become to those delusions and those deceptions the moment they come knocking on my door. The moment they come and they say, hear this, hear this. 
and I'll be handed something. I don't even know what it's about, but the Holy Ghost will tell me. Somebody handed me something a couple of years ago, and, and, and the moment I got it, the Holy Spirit says, that's new age. Okay, you don't have to listen to it. I didn't listen to it. But he, he will put stuff on the inside of you that inoculates you against the deceptions that's out there. This is why it's so important to stay with him. You won't run down these rabbit trails that people run down. And you will create an atmosphere of peace on the inside of you that when situations come, it changes how you handle them. See, And it will transform you to a place from maybe something would have come and, and, and been offered you from the devil like a temptation or a trial or a testing, whatever that may be. Maybe it's, maybe it's a flat tire and you would normally curse. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, let's get a little bit more serious. Maybe somebody's threatening your life. Anybody read about those kind of things in the word of God? And, and Paul will write, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into, I know that, that was James. When you fall into diverse temptations. How can you count it all joy? Because there's something, joy is not something that can be taken from you. It's not dependent on your circumstances. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to Isaiah chapter 26. I didn't use this verse last week, uh, but when I was editing the message, I heard it. And, um, and it's such a good verse for what we're trying to establish. So I'm just going to read a couple verses here. Isaiah chapter 26. Verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who, who will you keep in perfect peace? Right here. Whose mind is stayed. Everybody say stayed. stayed. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Everybody say everlasting. Everlasting, everlasting strength. How do you grow trust in God? How do you grow trust in a relationship? Okay. You know, my wife and I, we trust each other now more than we used to. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Right? When you're entering into a relationship, you young people, if you hear this, when you're entering into a relationship with somebody, uh, the challenge is to let your intimacy with somebody grow with the level of trust you have in them. Because it's easy to let your emotions run away and go do something they're not supposed to, but you don't know if you trust them or not. <laughs> See? And if your trust and your intimacy get out of balance, then you end up with a situation where uh, you have invested or vested somebody in who you don't trust and you're not on the same page with them in big life decisions and then something gets out of balance and something happens that you're not wanting to happen but see the challenge is is to with every incremental increase in trust there is an inter incremental increase in the intimacy that you have with that person so you start from zero, everybody starts from zero, and the culture that the world preaches is, is, is intimacy without any kind of relationship or trust. Just, you know, you only live once, right? <laughs> Just make all the same mistakes everybody else does. <laughs> That's what they preach. But see, the idea is that, okay, let's get on the same page, you and me. So when Natalie and I first started dating, we knew each other for, um, what was it? It was at least... I would say safely it was two years, two years and some change, two years, three months before we started dating. Okay, now I will be honest, I wanted to start dating within about two months of knowing her, but she, she was more cautious, okay? So, and rightly so, you have to win trust, okay? And that comes through exposure. Everybody say exposure. 
That comes through seeing people at good times, and that comes through seeing people at bad times. That comes through seeing people with their families. That comes through seeing people uh, when they're at high points, low points, under all kinds of different circumstances. And this is exactly what God is trying to do with each and every one of you. He's trying to get on the same page with you, okay? Now, it is a mistake, and especially in a romantic relationship, to share your heart with someone to a greater degree than your trust is at. Because if you do that, if you don't know who they are really, they're not going to handle your heart with as much care as you'd like. Anybody know what I'm talking about? See? And you can get hurt. And... Uh, so the idea is that with every step of trust, there's a step of intimacy. There's a step of relationship that's taken. And so some of the first levels of trust that I had to have with her was, hey, you, you believe in God, right? You know, yeah? Oh, yeah. All right, check. <laughs> now, I didn't, I didn't have a list. She had a list. I didn't have a list. <laughs> but check. All right. God, same page. He exists, yeah. Now we can talk about other things. You know, Holy Ghost, where, where are you at with the Holy Ghost? Oh, yeah, he's part of the church today. All right, check, you know. <laughs> what about gifts? Oh, yeah, we do the gifts. Check, you know. Now, it, it, w what you believe about God is one of the most important things about you. And it, I think it's Amos that says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? I mean, you got two couples on completely tra different trajectories. How are they, where are they going to go? How are they going to make decisions? And the, what you see in a lot of the worldly marriages is they just live together separately. They end up with their own money. They, they pursue their own dreams and they still kind of have a relationship somehow. That's not what real marriage is supposed to be about. Marriage is about merger. It's about one vision, one goal, working together as a team, somebody that you trust, Okay. It's not necessarily about you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Maybe there's part of it that way. But it's about working together, see? And it's the same thing with God. God isn't about vending machine type mentality. He's about son and daughter mentality. He's a, you know, in the Old Testament, he had nothing to work with. We weren't his sons and daughters. We could care less about our brothers. All he could do was vending machine mentality with the Old Testament saints. That's why it was you're blessed if you obey and you're cursed if you don't. <laughs> we were, spiritually, we were children in the sense that we were born without a nature like God's. We were born with the nature of our father, the devil, Jesus said. And we had to be born again. Everybody say born again. Born again. See, I'll just, just capsule this real briefly, but see, you know, <laughs> when we fell, we didn't have a heart like God's. And you have to take somebody and, and what the whole Old Testament was about, the Old Testament pointed to the fact that you're not like your father. You're not like God. You need to be born again. And so you cannot ask a fish to learn how to climb a tree. You can't because they don't have the equipment. And see, what the law did was precisely that. The law asked fish to climb trees. We were people of the world, and it said live holy. And what it was designed to do was to say, look, live holy. We can't. So they implemented the sacrifice system to show who Jesus was supposed to be when he came, to cover sin. See, when you receive Christ, you get born again. Everybody say born again. Born again. See, and now what the whole point of the gospel is, now you're not a sinner that's saved by grace. You have been born again, and you have, what I mean by that is you're not still a sinner. Everybody with me? We used to be but you've been born again, you have, your spots have been changed, your stripes have been removed, you're not who you are at your core, you have been given a choice, you didn't have a choice before, that's the whole problem. God was looking at humanity and saying, they need to live holy, they don't even know what's wrong with them, I have to give them a new birth, I have to give them my son. So when, now that Jesus has come, we're made sons and daughters, you have a choice now where you did not have one before, everybody say amen. What's the choice? It's, see, we like to think, well, we got born again. We can't do any wrong. No, that's the whole point. You have a choice now. You have the power to choose right and wrong because you have a nature on the inside of you that's like your father now. And you can, with that nature, say, I choose to live for God. I will not walk in sin. You have that power if you've been born again. The world does not have that power. Do you know that? 
Without Christ, you don't have the power to be free from sin. He's the one that gave you that power. The world can only receive Christ to have that power to make choices. They don't have it. That's why everyone needs the gospel. Because you're locked. You don't have it. The only choice option you have is Jesus or sin. And without Jesus, there is no choice but sin. That's what, that's what the whole law came to show you. See, when now you have been given the equipment on the inside to make choices for God. And that's why there's reward in heaven. Why, be there, why would there need to be any reward if everybody's predetermined for something? Why? Because you can make choices to walk in more and more. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind to go home and spend time in fellowship with him and put that in priority above everything else so that you can get on a continually more track of getting on the same page with God. Just like my wife and I, we're more on the same page now than we used to be because we step off more and more trust. And at some breaking point, there's enough trust built between us. We say, you know what? I'm on the same page with you with a lot of things about God. We believe the same things about God. We have the same vision for what God wanted me to do. There were some adjustments that had to be made, all right? There were things that we didn't agree on that God had to work out in us, and some of them were her things, and some of them were my things, okay? But those things had to be worked out pre-marriage. And then it's not like they all go away, but there was enough of a foundation there to say, look, we are ready to step into that. And we stepped into that. And now we're on the post side of that, but it's still the same process. It's not like just because you received Christ at one point, you can't fall away. The scriptures very clearly indicate you can. And that's what Paul was saying. He says, I still keep my body under subjection lest at any mean, at any time I myself become a castaway. And lest I, my body should start to rule me and I become reprobate in mine. And I start to follow the lusts of my flesh. And I start to follow after the things of the world. Because everybody's got a flesh. Nobody's exempt from that. Nobody's got a... The only head start you might have is, is maybe your upbringing gave you a different set of strongholds. But in Christ, you all have the same life. You all have the same starting line with Christ on the inside of you. Everybody with me? That first birth is not fair. There is no equality in the first birth. You don't get to decide whether you're born into poverty or born into wealth. You don't get to decide if you're born without a limb or born with, with some kind of other ailment. You don't get that decision. But with Christ... You all get the same first birth or the second birth. Everybody with me? And it is your choices that steward that life into greater and greater degrees of transformation. That's why there's reward. That's why that, you know, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my race. I have run my course. And there's a crown laid up for me. And he he very clearly will tell you about some of the people that, he says, with tears, I'm telling you about people that they serve their own belly. What, their, their God is their belly, their, their glory is in their shame, and they mind earthly things. They're all about this life. See? That's why there's a reward. Let's go to... Uh, hmm. Thank you, Father. We'll go to John chapter 14. See, Natalie's up here now, so I can't say some of the things about, uh, you know, mistakes she's made and things she's had to change because she was wrong, you know. <laughs> and I can't, because <laughs> she, she cried, call me out on some of my things, right? Right? I got some things. I don't know who has more. <laughs> I'll tell you a different version of what I was saying earlier. <laughs> but I was sharing about how we, we had to step things off and, and, and see when there's peace in a relationship with your spouse, it's because there's unity. And it's because you're on the same page. And you're, you're seeking God together and you're doing some of those things. Well, that's just a picture, okay? More important than unity in marriage is unity with your father. It's unity with your father, God. And getting on the same page with him. And that's really all I'm doing right now is expounding on what he said at the very beginning of this service. Because he's wanting a group of people to get on the same page with. 
He's wanting a group of people to run a race with. And, and Sunday at 10.30 to noon is not the amount of transformation required. It's time with him all the time. Now, I don't, I don't mean that you have to put yourself under condemnation, but it's just a matter of fact. If you're going to get an education or if you're going to get a school in the Spirit of God, you've got to put some time in outside of church. There's got to be times where you're worshiping him at home, and there's got to be times where you're praying and create a presence of peace at home. And that presence of peace at home, it's going to create an atmosphere in your mind over time. Everybody say, over time. That change will take place, and you're going to approach situations with peace instead of with fear and doubt. You're going to approach situations, your relationship with God will be stronger, and the things that used to rock your boat won't rock your boat. I'm trying to give some real-life examples to this, and, and I bet every one of you have some, okay? When we had our first son, that thing, that, that guy <laughs> rocked my boat really, really badly, and, and some of you came to church during that. He's, that was eight years ago almost now, seven and a half. And um, if you don't know that story, it's 54 hours of, of, uh, from beginning to end. I have grays up here to prove it, some right here. Oh, man, if I ever questioned what God was doing because I didn't know him. That's just being honest. And, and uh, I did not have peace inside of me one lick, did I? I think I was more crazy than you were at that time no peace because well, I mean I was ready for 18 hours I was ready for something ridiculous I thought but 54 not sleeping I mean and and now I'm complaining all right I'm just telling you what I went through but I felt the pressure of that I felt the burden of that of making a decision and um, I don't I won't go into all the details but I told the father at, at our 34 <laughs> I said God I can't hear you for squat right now and I don't have peace I says I'm in the middle of a decision I don't know what to do and I'm just being honest I said either you have somebody call me in 10 minutes or I'm just going to make this decision myself now I'm not there anymore praise God <laughs> but do you know what he will meet you where he you are and my testimony from that was I gave him that ultimatum, and it was 7.50, I still remember, I, it was 7.50 p.m., we were at night, it was at night, we were at our house, we were trying to have a home birth, when, and the, the, the midwife basically said, you could go either way, but the longer you stay at your home, uh, the, the greater risk, inherent risk, because we don't have uh, medical, she says, baby and, chi- and, and mother are fine, but you need to start thinking about if you need some extra medicine to help with the, with the uh, the labor because what had happened um, labor had begun slightly prematurely and her body was not ready for it and so that's why it took so long and so I said to the Lord I said at 750 I says you have somebody call me at 10 minutes in 10 minutes that has an answer I don't know who I just said somebody needs to tell me what to do because I can't hear you and you know at 759 my phone rings and I thought I was expecting, you know, one of my pastors or mentors or somebody I, I respect. And it was a lady that we were working with to find homes for um, one of dad's dogs. You know, dad had passed away. And uh, I was like, I can't handle this right now, lady. I'm not, I'm not interested in this. Uh, we, we can't find homes for the dog right now. <laughs> and, the, you know, if you're, if you're dense, I'm denser, you know. <laughs> I says, you know, and I started to say, I'm, my wife's in the middle of labor, and, and uh, we got to, and she says, you know what, I, I was, and, and she started to share her story about how she tried, exact, one for one, same story as me. Had, the, uh, uh, and we, we tried to have a home birth, didn't work. She says, you know, I went to the hospital, I got Pitocin, and it really helped speed things along, and that was the exact decision I faced at that time. The exact, to the letter, my midwife, didn't she say, she says, you, you can go to the hospital, get some Pitocin, and that'll help, you know, the speed things along. So I went and got in the car, and I prayed for 10 minutes. I said, you got to tell me what to do. And this lady called and says, I had Pitocin. You know, and I thought, honey, we're going to the hospital. <laughs> now, at the time, at the time, uh, you know, looking back on it, I can see how uh, in some ways childish we were, and we were young, but, but the Lord will meet you where you are. 
and the things that used to rock your boat won't rock your boat. And, um, and he will grow you up inside to where there's peace that's established like a rock. And, and you, this is what the testimony of the scriptures are supposed to do. It's not supposed to be some memorial that you gawk at throughout history. It's supposed to be, this is what God will do in your life. That you got people like Peter sentenced to death and he's asleep because he has peace on the inside because he knows who his God is. You got Paul who's shipwrecked, thrown on an island, gathering firewood to serve criminals, sentenced to death, and a snake bites his hand and he shakes it off in the fire because he knows who his God is. It will establish and transform you into somebody that can handle anything. Anything. And the more time you spend in his presence and in that peace, it will change how you think. It will change how you approach your relationship with your father. It is so real. And it's so, it's so right there, right now. You can go home today and spend as much time with him as you want. And see, the thing is, if you really believe this stuff, what, what's more important? What could be more important? Because he's wanting this book. So much of the church believes this book is established only to give authority to the scriptures. And that's all it's here for. It's established so that it can empower you to give authority to the scriptures every day you walk this earth. And they'll say, well, those works were only done to make the, the scriptures authority. How about you let them be authority today? How about you walk in the same things that he said we could have today? Because when he prayed, he says, what are you going to do with verses like the works that I do, you'll do also? What are you going to do with that verse? Oh, that was just for the 12. He prayed, he said, I pray not for these only, but for all those that will believe on their word after them. What are you going to do with those verses? What are you going to do with them? Most of the church, they, they like to think they believe the word of God over their experience, but they don't. They believe their experience over the word of God. Let the word of God change your experiences. Let the word of God help you see something different because everything's impossible until it's not. And once it's not, then people start to get on board with it. But you can get on board with it today. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove, everybody say prove. Prove what the will of God is. Why do you need to prove it? The same reason Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why do you need to pray that? Because it's not. And he wants it. And you can be the one to do it. Everybody say me. 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 Amen. I said John 14. I didn't read it, did I? <laughs> we'll read it. I feel like I preached an hour. <laughs> John 14, verse 23. Everybody's there. I got to go back there. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now what does that mean? Doesn't God love everybody? What if you don't keep his words? Does God still love you? Yes. So what is he talking about? <laughs> it's a different kind of love. It's the kind of love that comes through trust and relationship. See, I might love you, but you're never going to have, <laughs> you're never going to have what my wife and I have. See, it's a different kind. And this is what he's saying here. If a man loved me, he'll keep my words and my father will love him. Well, God loves everybody. This kind of love comes through fellowship. Everybody say Fellowship. And my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. 
And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being present with you, yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Everybody say all. All. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. What kind of peace? My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. So the world has a peace to offer. What makes the world's peace different than God's peace? The world's peace is circumstantial. The world's peace is dependent on circumstances. Everything has to be going your way for you to have the world's peace. So the world offers a peace, but it's not a lasting, permanent, spiritual peace. He's offering his peace, and his peace can go through any kind of storm. See, the world is about avoiding storm and risk. They're about avoidance. They're about safety because they can't handle things not going their way, not in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. Amen. But see, this is the kind of peace that can handle anything. That's the kind I want. But peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. And neither let it be afraid. Mm. You've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it comes to pass, you might believe. <clears throat> Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of the world cometh. But look at this. He has nothing in me. Why? Because he has God's peace. And that's the peace that he's giving you. And the enemy can come with any kind of smattering of circumstances. And it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't have to upset your boat. You can be sleeping in the boat. You can be trusting in God. You can know who he is. But it comes through times of fellowship. And the And what Jesus said there, if a man love God, he's going to keep his words and then God will come and make his abode with him. He'll come live in that place with him and it'll change you. And it's available right now. Everybody say now. Now. Let's be a people. I want to be able to get on the same page with God. I want to be able to have the same heart and the same vision. And see, this is, a, this is not just about you and God against the world, although that may feel that way sometimes. It's about the body of Christ operating as a team. And uh, I'll do one more sports analogy and we'll be done. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you, if you saw the F- Super Bowl or if you like sports, all of those guys, now some of them may look like they get the glory, they get to score the touchdown, but all of them are, had to be doing what they were doing. And when a play gets called, they all have to be on the same page, have to have that same mind. They all have to know it and be running it and doing it. And God, this is the end goal. He's trying to have a people that won't just meet on Sunday mornings, but they meet with him all the time. Practicing, hearing, presence, his heart. Not just, not just mindless robots being obedient, but having the same compassion on the inside of you. So that when you, you move in obedience, it's not just mechanical. There's a heart in you that has God's heart. That's really what it's about. Jesus was moved with compassion. So much so that the entire body of Christ, a group of people, is on the same page with God. That when God calls a play, you're all running it together. Everybody see how that's supposed to work? Amen. Father, I thank you. I thank you for knitting us together increasing the love of God on the inside of us. I thank you for need. First of all, I thank you for increasing unity in us with you every day, helping us to trust you more and more so that you can trust us with more and more. And also I pray, Father, for increased unity in the body of Christ, that as we come more and more online with what you have planned, we can come alongside other people that are on the same page, have the same heart, want to accomplish the same thing. And I do pray for a true unity in the body of Christ, an uncompromising 
unyielding, faith-filled, spirit-filled, love-filled unity. And together, we're going to accomplish your will on this earth in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.